Father, I just pray that your power and your glory will be revealed in this place this morning. I pray, Father, that each one of us will leave here enriched and more knowledgeable about how we need to live and act as a follower of Jesus. I just pray that your glory is shown and your glory is revealed. In Jesus' name, amen. We're continuing our series on the book of Acts. We're up to Acts 5. It's this week in Acts 5, we find some very interesting scriptures. I've put up on there two scriptures. These, to me, frame what's happening in Acts at the moment. Acts 5, 14 says, And more than ever believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. And then Acts 5, 42, And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease preaching and teaching that the Christ is Jesus. Do you see how those two go together? Why were people being added? Because God was moving, but more than just God was moving, the disciples, the apostles at this point, were out there acting in obedience and proclaiming the word. I've been in many situations where in churches we've prayed for revival and for new converts and believers, and we've prayed and prayed and prayed. You know what we haven't done? Gone out and proclaimed the word. And I just want to encourage you to know that if we want the kingdom to grow, we have to be involved in the proclamation of God. We have to go out and share with people. We have to go out and tell people. Some of you are thinking, that's not my thing. That's fine. As you'll see in the end, we all have a role to play. Not the whole church at this point was the apostles. As you'll see in a minute, it was only the apostles that were there, there preaching at this point. This is just talking about the apostles. But I would encourage you to know that every other member of the church had a role. That it wasn't happening in a vacuum. It was part of God's plan and the church, as we saw last week, or was it the week before, that the church was acting of one accord. They were sharing. They were doing things together. They were a supportive body who were loving and working together. So, Acts 4, we see that they've gone and boldly prayed for the Spirit to come and give them boldness. They've asked for God to move and they are now going out and preaching. And we see that when the power of God comes, you get two responses. And as the power of God moves, they're not mild responses, you get two strong responses. The first response was accepting the word of God. And we hear that multitudes were added. And we have the other response, which is upset, rejection, hatred for the messenger. Who likes a messenger who makes them feel guilty? Who likes a messenger who comes to you and says, hello there, my friend, your life is wrong. You're in power for all the wrong reasons. Your attitudes are not right. You don't even have to say those. You just have to say, here's the way it should be. And people immediately think, oh, that's not how I am. How does that make people feel, particularly people of wealth and power? So the word of God came and it divided. Some people turned to it and other people got very upset. And we see two responses in this. So let's have a look at Acts 5, 12 to 16. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. First thing is, no one else dared to join them. Most of the commentaries think that's talking about the rest of the, the believers. Basically, the apostles were going out, called and directed by God, and they'd been threatened with jail and they'd been put in jail and all sorts of things had happened. So the, the general consensus is, it's saying the rest of the believers didn't come out and preach every day in the temple. They stayed at home. Or they stayed wherever they were and did their own thing. And then moving on to 15. 
so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them in cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So we've got God moving mightily. We've got people boldly proclaiming the word and God acting with power. No, it wasn't their shadow that healed them. They did not have miraculous shadows. But if you look in um, chapter 4, verse 30, it said, While you stretch out your hand to heal, the signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. They went out with faith and they put out their hand. They prayed. They spoke words of faith over the crowd. And it was that that was healing. It was the faith, the word of God and the power of God. Those in power, of course, as we've seen before, don't like this sort of thing. How does the world respond today to a powerful church? A church that says, no, not everything is right. Morality is not about what you want to believe at the moment. Political correctness is not correctness. Imagine if a church today said that with power and with authority. The civil authorities, I don't think, would be happy. The media would be frantic. News.com would have headlines you wouldn't believe. Can you see it? It was like that, only worse. Because what was happened was the land was under the Romans but ruled by the Sadducees and the Jewish council. And they got their power through tradition. They got their, their power through her, their family line, their birth, and their education in the traditional texts. Now they've got these people who are saying there's a different way and proclaiming the teaching of Jesus. And the teaching of Jesus was not in support of the Sadducees. It was teaching of a very different type. It was about love. It was about generosity. It was about sharing. It was about giving. It was not about power and authority. So what happened was, of course, when the priests heard this was happening, they came together and they wanted them arrested again. So they had them thrown in public prison. I thought, why public prison? What's the difference between public prison and other prison? And all I could find was really that they're saying public prison because it was a place where it was very public that you're in prison to humiliate the disciples. They were trying to say these are not respectable men. Look at them. They're locked up with the common thieves. That's where they belong. They were trying to paint them as not people you would ever listen to. But then in 5, 19 and 20, it says, And during the night an angel of the Lord opened the prison door and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to preach. God is not backing down at this point. And how brave were the, the, the apostles at this point? I don't know about you, but if I just had a prison break, just got lifted out of being in jail, under threat of beating and death, I would not go to a public place and preach. That would not be my first thought. Wouldn't be my second thought either, to be perfectly honest, or my third thought. I would want to go, hightail it back to all the others and say, oh dear, what do I do now? I'm in trouble. But these guys had prayed for boldness and they'd been given boldness. So when God said, preach, they went and preached. And we wonder why the church was growing rapidly. What we see here is unconditional obedience. And that is one of the things that God desires of us. So the priest's response, they called together the council and the senate of all the people. This is the body that had power to do things. This is the body that ruled. This is the body that could really cause them problems. And they sent soldiers to get Peter and the apostles. 
it's pretty clear from this that at this point their, in, their intention was to end the threat one way or another. 23 and 20 to 26. What we found, this is the guards speaking, the people who were sent, the soldiers. We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the door. For when we opened them, we found no one inside. When the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. Isn't that a great word, perplexed? If I went to get prisoners and the door's locked and the guards are at the door and there's nobody in there, I would be more than perplexed. I would be thrown. I would be confused. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because you think at this point, Anybody with their eyes open would say the power of God's at work. But as you probably all know when you proclaim the gospel, unless people are willing to open their heart, they don't see the obvious in front of them. Unless people are willing to listen and look with an open mind, it just doesn't happen. Unless the Spirit of God has sown that seed within them that, that in livens their heart. They can't see the obvious. And then in 25, and someone came and told them, look, the men you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain and the, with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. Okay, isn't it interesting? We've got a divide. We've got the people who hold them in high esteem because they are preaching to the people they're preaching to the people in need. But we have the authorities who are saying, we hate this. We want those people to be how? Under our thumb? We want those people to be subjected to us. So there's a real divide. Can you imagine how the Sadducees and the Jewish officials were feeling at this point? They would have been absolutely beside themselves. Their livelihood, their rule, everything is at threat. So they were brought before the council. And it's really interesting. I find this next verse really interesting. 528. Here's, here's what they said. We strictly charge you not to teach in his name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. This is the law court. Do you see a legal charge there? Do you see them saying you have broken the Jewish law? You have broken the Roman law? Here's why you're in jail. Do you see any of that? What are they saying? It's almost like a petulant child. I can almost see him stamping their foot, saying, you won't do what you're told. And you're trying to blame us for what we did. Which is basically the story. They knew that they crucified Jesus, but you're blaming us for it. So what we have is obviously people who they are not responding with their mind, they're responding with their fear. They're responding to the word of God has frightened them. The word of God has called them. They, they would have heard the message. They've been called to repent. And what are they saying? I'm not going to repent. I'm going to double down. I'm going to dig in deeper and I'm going to stay where I am. Again, have you heard people in the community have that response to the word of God? Yeah. It happens, doesn't it? They have been denied. They have been refused. They have been rejected. People will not do what they want. So what happens now? Peter gets a chance to talk to them. Does he talk to them in an appeasing manner? Look, it's all right, guys. Just take it easy. It'll be okay. Just Does he talk to them like that? No, he gets in their face. Now, there is a time to get in the people's face about the gospel. But I'll tell you when that is. That's under the direct direction of God. It's when God says, this is my moment to cause a front. It's not when you just feel like getting in someone's face. It's not when you just think, no. I've got to proclaim the word in a brutal fashion and upset these people or they'll never... No. 
tell you what, as a whole, do upset people listen very well? I think God's basically said, these guys aren't going to listen. We're going to tell them straight. And let's hope and pray that something gets through. So under God's direct orders, they stand up and they say, oh, just making sure you get me when I stay in there. I don't say you back down, but our job is not to cause a front because we want to. Our job is to speak as God wants us to speak. To be blunt when God wants us to, to be blunt and to be softer when God wants us to be softer. Then in 5, 29 to 33. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus whom you killed by hanging on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and saviour to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Whoa, what were the two accusations? You won't do what we say. What's his first response? We obey God, not men. Now, the Sadducees believed that they were the interpreters of what was happening and they were the rulers of the law. So they would have been saying what? We are God's rulers. We have God's law. There were Pharisees there as well, the legal people. They were the people who believed they held the law, but they're saying, no, we're following God, not you. And the next one, what does he say? You hung him on a tree. Again, what was their accusation? You're pinning it on us, and they again immediately come back and say, yep, we're not doing what you want, and it's on you. Then in 32, and we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. Again, as you've heard before, Jewish law, two witnesses to something. It was considered proven. So they're saying we're witnesses. What they're actually saying is, and his resurrection is actually a legally acceptable thing within our society because we here are. Witnesses, we saw it and that's all the evidence that you should actually require. So basically what they're saying is, no, yes you did and legally we're standing right. Now if you say that to somebody who thinks they're in power and you're threatening, they do not respond well. So as you can imagine, they became very angry and they wanted to kill them on the, well not on the spot, but through their own legal processes. Then, it's interesting, in the next little passage, a bloke called Gamaliel. Tradition says he was actually the person that taught the law to Paul. But who knows? But Gamaliel was a pragmatist. And he said, okay, guys, let's, let's take it easy here. Let's settle. He says, Thaddeus rose up with 400 supporters, and he died, and they disappeared. Then he says, Judas the Galilean, about the time of the census, he had lots of followers. He died, and they all dispersed. Let's just wait. Let's see if now Jesus is dead, the whole thing's just going to fizzle out. Let's just wait and have a look. I think, is he a good guy? No, he's not a good guy. It's just another response to the gospel, isn't it? Yeah, maybe later I'll listen. Let me just, yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, I'm very pleased you believe what you believe. Let's just wait and see what happens. It's just another response, but it's also a response that just says, no, I'm not going with it. I'm not changing from where I am, but I'm just taking a slightly more careful approach. So the next 5, 38 and 39. So in the present case, I tell you, Keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan of all this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. How pragmatic can you get? Might actually be right. Might be wrong. And then in 42, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching 
that Christ is Jesus. So they didn't stop. But the scary bit comes just before that. What it says before that in 40 to 42 is this. This is the bit that challenges in a really big way. And when they called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. They then left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Does anyone else find that challenging? If I was beaten for the name of Jesus, I'd probably think, okay, it happened. I'd, I'd be very unhappy. I would not be saying, thank you, God, I was considered worthy for that beating. Would anybody have that response? It, it just speaks to the level of faith that these guys had and how strong the Spirit was moving. But I, I think their faith was actually also to do with their commitment. They had committed to God, so the Spirit of God empowered them and enriched them greatly. They weren't mucking around on the fringe playing games. They were in there 100%. And I believe that God was honouring their commitment by giving them a real gift of faith, a real extraordinary faith. We're called to participate in God's story. How can you participate in God's story? I'm going to acknowledge up front, I don't have the boldness of one of these guys. I don't have the, I don't know what it was they had. The, I, I don't have it to the extent that they had it. I, I, do any of you? I'm not seeing a whole lot of, yeah, me, I do. They were really out there with faith and they were doing things. But the rest of the people, the whole congregation was one accord. These guys were preaching every day. How were they living? They were being supported by the, disciples, by the rest of the disciples. What were the rest of the disciples doing? They were empowering these guys to speak. They were praying for them. They were participating in this, not by necessarily being the one who was out there doing the mass conference and the big speech, but they were participating in this through their prayers, through their finances, through their emotional support, probably through meals, through every other way imaginable. They were participating through this in the way God had called them and gifted them. And I want to encourage you today to participate in God's story in the way that he has made you and how he has gifted you. If we want the kingdom to grow, then we have to invest our time in growing the kingdom. We might not be the upfront. We might not be the next Billy Graham. But behind Billy Graham, there was hundreds and hundreds of people who were making it happen, who were also participating in God's story and spreading the word of God. I'm going to use a very quick example. As a little kid, I was in the choir. I didn't sing all that well, but I went in the choir because I loved music and I loved church music. As I grew up, my voice broke and the word broke for my voice was very appropriate and I am now dead flat. I know I'm flat. I hear I'm flat. And for years, I thought I would love to be involved in the worship. That was the one thing that really, really Knocked me down. Yeah, you know, I found almost depressing. I don't know why, but I just did because that's something I love. It hit me years later. Over the years, I have been the one that bought the equipment and chose it. I have been the one who did lots of setup and getting ready. I have done masses of mixing and putting it together. You know what? I have been involved in worship all those years. I have participated with the skills and the abilities that God gave me. Often, why? Because I thought I want to be involved in worship. No, often it was because there was no one else to do it. But God has used me to participate in something I always wanted to participate in and I was just too dopey to realise. I want you guys to know that God wants you to participate in his story, in the growth of his kingdom by contributing in what you can do and what God has gifted and called you to do. By to by, yeah, talk to your friends about Jesus. But we're not all called to be evangelists. By getting out and making it happen for the evangelists, by being 
that person that is there supporting, helping. And then maybe one day God will tap you on the shoulder and do that scary thing he does at one time and says, do you know how you think you can't talk in public? Well, you're going to. You know how you thought you're not an evangelist? Well, guess what, my friend? I've just placed my call upon your life and you're going to do it. But I want to encourage you to participate in God's story by doing what God has called you to do, by having a focus on evangelism and supporting others, doing your own bit and making it happen. Because we are all called to grow the church. And I also think, imagine all these thousands of people added to the church. Who was discipling them? Peter wasn't doing it himself. There were people there discipling doing all the other stuff that just had to happen to make this wonderful time of church growth happen. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that you do place your hands upon us. I pray, Father, that you give us a desire to participate in your story. I pray, Father, that you give us ways to participate in your story. I pray, Father, that you allow us to have hearts of faith, to use the skills you have given us to support, to do, and to grow your kingdom. I pray, Father, that each one of us is a part of a mighty going out of the word of God and that your name is glorified in our community and in our land. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I just pray that you all go in peace and go in the power of God.